And uh, I'm working hard on getting the next book down on the kingdom priesthood, and we'll be touching on some of that in, in, the, in the weeks to come. If you have your Bibles today, I want to go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and this is part 48 of Understanding the Kingdom, and I want to take a fresh look at the day of Pentecost. Uh, it, 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 usually whenever you look at, you know, Acts chapter 2, you have, you have two camps. You have the Baptist camp and those within that genre that basically say this is the birth of the church because there was something born called ecclesia in the Greek. And what they fail to recognize is that when you look at the Septuagint, Gahal, which, which in the Hebrew means those that were called out of Babylon, called out of Egypt, that were assembled, Gahal, when the rabbis translated the Septuagint, they used ecclesia to translate that because it's the appropriate word. And there's, there, there is always symmetry in the Word of God, and there's continuity that goes from Genesis to Revelation. And we, we sever that at our peril. And so it, it's not necessarily the creation of those gathered. It's the supernatural empowerment of what God had originally intended when he called Abraham. It's part of the solution of Genesis chapter 3, as well as Genesis chapter 6, believe it or not. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser has done a wonderful book called Reversing Hermon, which shows how that the mission of Jesus was to reverse everything that the watchers had done. And I mean, know the cross is enough no matter what your problem is. And so I want to look at this, and, and we, we have to go beyond that, and we have to go beyond just speaking in tongues is what the Pentecostals would frame this is, because I think what we have done, and speaking in tongues and having our prayer language is important, but it's not just solely for that. You've got to add a lot of other things to it. If you don't, we're falling short of what Almighty God wanted. Now, I want to look at this first in the King James. Jesus told his disciples, but you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, uh, will be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I want to read it from the Amplified because I think the Amplified has done an outstanding job of, of, of expounding what dudamus means that are trying to within the text itself. And ye shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And ye will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. So they, they took dunamis and they separated it as ability, efficiency, and might. Now we're going to begin looking at Scripture and seeing how there, there, there is that continuity of Scripture and when Jesus spoke these things, I believe the disciples in the first century understood it more than we understand it today. Now, when you look up Deuteronomy in, in Strong's and as well as in Thayer's, what everybody always pulls out is a subcategory of what that word means, which is miracle working power. And everybody likes to really center in up on that. And that is one vital component. But you've got to begin putting all the pieces of the puzzle together to realize what God wants us to do. Now, this word dunamis means strength, power, ability. Listen to the next word. Inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So with the new birth, there is inherent power that is embedded with us by the very inherent nature that we have received. Or which a thing, a person or thing exerts or puts forth. One B, the power to perform miracles. One, uh, one C, Listen to this one. This is, we're also going to see this from Scripture, and Paul brings this out. Moral power and excellence of soul. Okay? 1D, the power and influence which belongs to riches and wealth. 1E, power and resources arising from numbers. 1F, power consisting in or resting upon armies, forces, or hosts. And so there's really a broad term of any time that there's any kind of power released in the earth. This word dunamis is contained within that. 
And so what, what he's really talking about is the power of the kingdom is going to be released in you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But yet we, uh, I have not found anyone who has given a full definition of what that power is. Because I have seen too many people that speak in tongues that manifest none of the other uh, di dimensions of that power. And we've got to seek it all. Because your faith, and part of understanding the word is we cannot see beyond our own personal paradigm. One of the dynamics that, that we have lost in our, in our Greco-Roman mindsets of understanding the Word, as you read through the Torah, it, it's supposed to get you to ask questions. It, and part of asking questions and having that dynamic of the Word of God begin to answer you back and the Holy Spirit begin to answer you back, it gets you to the place where He's trying to position you to ask the right question because you cannot see in the Word what is beyond your own paradigm. That's why we can have folks look at the exact same scriptures. Their paradigm is pre-trib, pre-mill, and that's all they can see. Somebody that is post-trib, pre-mill looks at that and says, how in the world can you get that out of those scriptures? And the pre-trib are saying the same thing to the post-trib because our own mindsets can jaundice what we are extrapolating out of the Word of God. And so there is encoded within the Word the practice of asking questions of the, of the Word of God engaging our imagination as we meditate on the Word so that the Holy Spirit can get us to ask the right questions. And one of the questions I've had to ask myself, is there more beyond tongues? Although there's great benefit to it, there's also what I, what I have seen is even those that, that, that pray in the Spirit and have that gift are lacking in many other areas. But yet all of that and everything that they're needing is embedded in this word Jesus used dudamus when he said that there's this power going to be released in you, the power of the kingdom. Now the first one is inherent power. In the Old Testament, the, the rule is that the Holy Spirit would come upon the prophet, priest, and king. But how many know there's an exception to that rule? We find in Exodus 31, starting in verse 3, now this is those that were craftsmen that were, that were engaging in building the tabernacle of Moses. So they were engaged in building the temple, and that's going to be crucial for us to understand because this is all going to connect together. In verse 3 it says, I will fill him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all the manner to, uh, of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and silver and brass and then the cunning of stones to set them and in the carving of timber to work in all matters of workmanship. And, there, and the Holy Spirit came upon the workers that were laboring in it to take that to a whole nother dimension. They, there was an anointing of God that took their talents that they had, those innate talents that God had given, those, given them and supercharge them to take them to the next level for the purpose of the kingdom. Now, how many of us have been taught whatever our craft is in the earth, because not everybody's called to the five-fold ministry, that all of us, whether, whether we're working in an office or we're a craftsman working with our hands, that there is an anointing that can come on us, that we can figure out things that nobody else can figure out, that we can do things that nobody else can do, so that as we begin doing them and they look at our integrity and, and the wisdom that we do things and say, where in the world did you get that ability? You can point to Jesus and you can point to the Word of God and tell them the kingdom of God is working through me to do those things. Now what's an interesting little known fact, when you, when you look at how that they made the menorah in the Torah, you know it's beaten and, and there's leaves and it all connects. There was a supernatural wisdom that came upon them when they built that thing, you know, because it's, it's layers of beaten gold and everything, but it doesn't leak. It's made of gold, but yet it, it stands together. Israel has tried to reproduce the menorah according to the pattern that they found in Torah. They can't do it. Now there's one in a courtyard that where then they've got it all in glass because it's actually gold that nobody can mess with, but it's so heavy that the beaten that the arms begin to go down. There has to be arm support. 
because there's, there's a supernatural wisdom that God gave the craftsmen in the way that they folded the gold and put it together, that gave it a strength to hold it together that no one yet has been able to figure out. You see, that's important historically. Uh, boy, my allergies are bothering me today. Historically, historically, we, there have been movers and shakers in business in America and around the world that were Christians. And when other people saw problems, they saw solutions. And they were shakers and movers in industry that and always gave God the glory. And I think we're going to, there's something called marketplace evangelism. When, when you do what, you, what you're doing to the glory of God. Didn't the Apostle Paul say, tell us, whatever we say, word or, do, word or deed, do it as unto the Lord? Why? Because with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have been given an anointing for Him to uh, give us supernatural ability with whatever craftsmanship that we have. There should be like Daniel, there should be a spirit of excellence in everything that we do. There should be, no Christian name should go on anything that is done half-heartedly. But see, unless you can see this in the Word and reach out your faith to believe it, it's faith that causes us to access these things once we know they're available. It's kind of like in the world, uh, there was a time where nobody could break the four-minute mile. In fact, there were doctors that uh, came and said nobody should do it because if a man would, go, would break a four-minute mile, his heart would explode. And so there was this psychological barrier that nobody can break a four-minute mile until somebody did it. And after somebody did it, man realized it was, the ability was done. Within weeks, it was broken again and again and again and again because they realized that that barrier was one of their own making. How many of us have barriers in our career of our own making because we're simply trying to do it out of our own talent and we're not looking for the Holy Spirit to empower us so that we can do it through His anointing with an excellence that only comes through the kingdom of God. This is much a part of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. Yet, it is very rarely ever taught, very rarely ever accessed. Employers should be blessed because there's a Christian working among the, amongst them. And the gift that's within them ought, ought to cause them to rise to leadership. We should change the atmosphere rather than the atmosphere changing us. But we've got to realize that that's possible. And if it's ever, never taught, if we have no expectation for it, we're never going to see it manifested. Let's go to the next one. The next one was moral power <coughs> and excellence of soul. Now, I want to connect the very first Pentecost was when Moses took them to Mount Sinai and set the mountain on fire. God spoke to them. That was where, and in fact, Pentecost within the Jewish community is the celebration of the giving of Torah. Because God met with them on the mountain and the same fire that was on the mountain appeared like cloven tongues and set on the heads of those that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Which, I mean, this is, this is a whole dichotomy that contrasts the fire of the Nechesh in Genesis chapter 3. Of true illumination can only come from God. Anything, any other source is, is tainted knowledge that brings corruption and heartbreak. But I want to look at something that the Apostle Paul said because, you see, on the... On the day of Pentecost that we have in the book of Acts, the first day of Pentecost, the Torah was given. The day of Pentecost after the resurrection of Messiah, the power was given to live it. Now, I want you to listen to this argument the Apostle Paul gave to the rabbis that were in Rome regarding the acceptance of Gentiles that had accepted Messiah. And this is found in Romans chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many that have sinned without the law also perish without the law. 
You need to underline that in your Bible. Because there's people going around saying, Jesus did away with the law, therefore everybody gets to go to heaven. That flies right in the face of what the Apostle Paul said. All the Gentiles that it never was taught Torah, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of them died and went to hell. Just like a lot of we could say today. People that die without Christ end up in hell. The reason he came was to save. Okay? He goes on to say, And as many that have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearer of the law is just before God. Now underline the next part. But the doer of the law shall be justified. So he's getting to something here. How do you get justified by for God? The proof of your salvation is what you do with the law. Ouch. For when the Gentile which have not the law do by nature. They have the power inherent in their new nature. Okay, connect the two together. That do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Now what he's not saying is that we're just a law unto ourselves, we can do what we want, that as we're following the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God has written the Torah on our hearts, collectively as we're working this out, even though we may have never studied the commandments of God, this new nature among us is causing us to want to do it so that we are a demonstration of the law to each other. Okay? which shows the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the means while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now I want to read it by Dr. David Stern, his translation, the complete Jewish Bible, because for some reason people flinch when you read law because we react to it like a Greco-Roman that law is bad. Whenever you mention law to a Jew, they dance. They get excited because Torah means life. It's the loving instruction of God. For God does not show favoritism. All have sinned outside the framework of Torah will be judged outside the framework of Torah. And also, and all, and all who are, have sinned within the framework of Torah will be judged by the Torah. For the, it is not merely the hearing of Torah whom God considers righteous. Rather, it is the doers of what Torah says whom ha who will be made righteous in God's sight. Well, it's sad to say that Paul didn't understand his own revelation that the Torah had been done away with. Paul needs to read his other epistles. Or maybe we have translated them incorrectly because of our wrong paradigm, our wrong mindset. We're still echoing what Constantine said, let us have nothing in common with the Jews, which means anything before the book of Malachi, or after, you know, go to the book of, of Matthew. Genesis to Malachi doesn't apply. According to the Apostle Paul, that's wrong. Okay. For whenever Gentiles who have no Torah do naturally what the Torah requires, then these, even though they have not Torah, for themselves are Torah. Now that takes it up to a whole nother level. When, when, when a believer is living the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, you see, Jesus was the Torah made flesh. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, by this new nature, we become Torah. Uh-oh. We've been taught wrong, haven't we? For their lives show that the conduct 
that the Torah dictates is written in their hearts. Their conscience also bear witness of this, for their con- conflicting thoughts sometimes cause them and sometimes defends them. One day when God passes judgment on people's inward secrets, according to the good news as I proclaimed, He does this through Messiah Yeshua. So that inert, abil- that, that inert or inheritability that we have in our new nature in Christ causes us to want to keep the commandments of God. Bad theology gets our head in conflict with our heart, our spirit man. And the Apostle John says we have, we have this boldness before God and, and this conviction that we're going to be heard because we keep His commandments. So having adversarial position with the Torah can actually affect your prayer life. You can't be in a position of rebellion and get answers, even if you've simply been taught to do it. That may be one of the chief causes in the body of Christ for unanswered prayer. So while everyone is looking for tongues as a sign of receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, should we also not be looking for a greater depth of personal holiness in the lives of those that claim to have received the baptism? Let me give you an historical proof of this. James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, the one who wrote the book of James, actually his name isn't James, James, it's Jacob. They changed it to honor King James, and it kind of stuck. He was hated among the Pharisees because of him preaching Messiah. Even those that hated him called him Jacob the righteous. They called him righteous and gave him one chance to deny Jesus. And when he refused to start preaching Christ, they threw him off a wall. That's how he died. He was one of the chief elders in Jerusalem. And even his enemies called him a righteous man that was keeping Torah, that he was known for his zealousness over the Torah of God. Can that be said today? That our enemies look at us and say, you're zealous for the things of God. I think we need to open our eyes to the full dimension of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next definition, the influence that belongs to riches and wealth. Now, I'm going to come at this sideways. Can I do that? Because when we think of riches and wealth, we think of silver and gold. We think of what Babylon has defined as worldly power, worldly riches. But there was a day that Peter was coming, walking into the temple. We find this in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6. And the guy was asking alms. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, such as I have, such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter was able to tap into riches that manifested a power that this world cannot comprehend. He was able to tap into the supernatural power of God that flows from the throne of God that is greater than any wealth the world can give you. There are men today that are billionaires that are dying because medicine can't keep them alive. There there is always a limit to the power of Babylon. There is always a limit to what man can do. On the other side of that is the kingdom of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit allows us to move in the riches of a greater kingdom than this world has. But once again, we've got to know that it's there and it's available. On that day of Pentecost, the fivefold ministry was released in power into the body. I want to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 8 through 16, I want to go all the way up to 8 because you'll, uh, people always want to jump down to 13, but they miss the symbology that the Apostle Paul is tapping into. And what's interesting, when you look at the Apostle, Prophet, Prophet Evangelist, Pastor, and Teacher, all of those were offices that had functioned for hundreds, if not over a thousand years, in the synagogue. 
that when Ezra and Nehemiah had established the synagogue in Babylon, they began setting offices in the place. In fact, the, the chief person in a synagogue wasn't called the pastor, he was called the president. It's still that way today, something interesting. But that's why when they, they knew what apostles were. In fact, the ancient rabbi, the sages of Israel, and when the apostle Paul said that, that the faith that we have is based upon the apostles and prophets, Jesus being the chief cornerstone, he wasn't referring to the ones that were there on the day of Pentecost. Apostle means one sent forth. The first apostle was Moses. He was sent forth to deliver. He was sent from the presence of God, and he came into Egypt as an apostle of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first prophet was a man named Abraham because God came down and talked with him and developed a friendship. And so when the Apostle Paul was saying that in the book of Ephesians, he was looking at all the Old Testament saints. And he was saying, upon the prophets, upon those that were sent by God for specific tasks, that they all lined up with Jesus because Jesus is found in Genesis 1-1 as the Isle of Tav. That John talks about that word that resided right, right next to Elohim in the beginning. Everything in the word from Genesis 1 has to line up with Jesus. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Abraham lined up with Jesus. And I fa in fact, I believe Jesus came and visited him as Melchizedek. Moses lined up with Jesus, and Jesus was in the burning bush. Jesus is the one who parted the Red Sea. Jesus is the one. Because you see a transition in the Hebrew when we, we see in the beginning it's Elohim. Now in Genesis 1-1 it's Et Elohim, the Al of Tav. But then so it's Elohim creating, Elohim creating. The minute he creates man, the Al of Tav becomes Yahweh. So now it is Yahweh Elohim, the God with the nailed hand that shall be revealed twice, makes man. That's why the Word of God says that everything that was ever created was created by Him. In fact, that Word, I'm kind of jumping around in my notes, but this is okay, this is good. In Hebrew, we have Hashamayim, which is plural, Hasha does not appear one time in Hebrew Scripture, the, a singular version of heaven. You have to kind of take it into context to figure out which, because there's three heavens. And so its counterpart in Greek can, can mean the sky, it can mean outer space, and it can, be, it, it, it can mean the third heaven, second heaven, it can be the entire universe. So Paul picked the closest Greek word that he could find, the Hashamayim. So everything that was ever created in the heavens or the earth was created by Jesus. His Yahweh Elohim. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. So all of them, and so all the Old Testament saints that lined up and did exploits for God were the ones who lined up greatly with the cornerstone. And that's their our example and what he established in them and the things that he taught them. And we learn from what they did right, we learn from what they did wrong. What they did wrong didn't line up with the cornerstone. And here's one for you. The, cor the Torah was not only lined up with the cornerstone, it's the loving instruction of the cornerstone. And then the cornerstone walked among us and said, if you love me, keep my commandments. They knew exactly what he was talking about. So we see all this here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses six, or 8 through 16. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Okay? So he ascended. Ten days later, you have the day of Pentecost. He gives gifts unto men, and part of those gifts in the context of this scripture was the fivefold ministry. 
So the fivefold ministry is connected to the baptism in the Holy Spirit and this, and this ability to function in the kingdom. Now in this entire section in Ephesians, he said that the fivefold ministry is here, and so it existed before the New Testament as far as offices. Paul extrapolates them out of the synagogue, and really a true fellowship has to still follow the synagogal model. It has to be a house of study, a house of worship and prayer, and a house of fellowship. That's all. That's the synagogal model. It's based upon the tabernacle. It's also based upon the, uh, the, the tent of Abraham. The tent of Abraham had three chambers just like, just like the, t- the tabernacle did. So you kind of wonder if God showed him some things and if he did not make his, t- his tent after the, what he saw. It's almost like the chicken or the egg, which one came first? Because there, there has always been those that walked with God. As the Holy Spirit begins to empower them, God begins to show them things And here's where we need to learn the example. They begin to pattern their lives from what God shows them. That's the Hebraic way of doing things. The Greco-Roman way of doing things is not doing any of it, but expounding on it for hours and showing everybody everything you know. Because you can expound on it. Hebraically, unless you're living it, you can't teach it. Because your life is louder than the words you're teaching. But it said, he said, we're, and, and he's, all these are there till we come into the unity of faith and, and the full stature of Christ. Is the body yet, there yet? No, it's not. Part of the problem that we have, and even in the Protestant church, we still model the priesthood and we model a lot of things after the Roman Catholic Church. You know, why, why does everybody meet on Sunday? Now, we can go through all kinds of things, and they'll do gymnastics around it. The Catholic Church is very blunt about it. We established Sunday worship. We made it illegal to do, to do Saturday worship. And, we, and, we, and there is not one single place in the Word of God that says to, to worship on Sunday. And what the Catholic Church says, as long as you're doing that, you're declaring that the Catholic Church is greater than the Word of God. That's their own words, not mine. That's theirs. We still look at the priesthood based upon the way that they did things, laity and clergy. In the kingdom, it's priesthood of the believer. There are certain ones that are in the body, a part of the fivefold ministry, and it's to prepare the rest of the body. Now listen to this. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. That perfecting means maturing. For the maturing of the saints, in the Greek, that comma is not there for the work of the ministry. The maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry. Because ministry is how you live, it's not what you do. And for the edifying of the body of Christ... Till we all come into the unity of faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto the perfect man, and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by the cunning of craftiness, which lie to uh, lie in wait to, to deceive, but speak the truth in love. Now, all it takes is five minutes on any social media, and you will know that this has not come to pass. For some reason in this day and age, because we have not been taught the full counsel of the Word of God, that there is a hunger out there for exotic teachings. And whatever wild and weird thing that's being taught, people will run after. Some of it, it makes you scratch your head and saying, how in the world can anybody believe that? It's because we have not been mature because we still need the five-fold ministry, but we need to have our paradigms altered about what they're to do and what we're to do. And when you understand every one of us are called to be a priest, you are called to be a scholar of the Word of God. Every single one of us. That we're required by God to know the Word and be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the Word. But he goes on. Then he goes on. 
to speak in love, speak in love, speak in love, speak in love. How many have seen a lot of love on social media here lately of people calling themselves Christians? I've had to call some students on some things with the seminary because of their attitude in the way that they were writing. And some of it stems from the Hebraic Roots movement. Some will come from a fundamentalist background movement. Some a spirit-filled background movement. You know, backgrounds. But it's like, we have arrived and you're all too stupid to see this and blah, 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 blah. How much of that's in love? I've seen them do everything but tell somebody their mama wears combat boots. Of course, my kids, you know, that's just a compliment to them. But just the rhetoric and the, and the, and the backbiting and the, the sniping that's going on shows that we're not mature. If we were mature, a lot of things that have gotten traction on the internet would have never moved an inch. Therefore, we need it. The Apostle Paul was saying the fivefold ministry there is to prepare the saints for ministry, to bring unity on the truth of Messiah and the kingdom, to fully know Messiah, to mature to the full stature of who Jesus is within us, to no longer chase after every new and exotic doctrine, but be founded and established in the faith and in the Word of God. And then to speak the truth in love, and then we begin functioning as a body the way that we're supposed to. If you beat yourself up all the time, that is a form of abuse. And we have, we have the body of Christ that they, they have a firing squad that is made in a circle so they can shoot each other. They kill their wounded and they're constantly beating each other up. We need the five-fold ministry more than ever. Now, I want to go on to the last point because this is actually going to set up for our next session. There is an anointing coming in this generation. Now, hear me on this. Just as there was an anointing on the craftsmen to build the tabernacle of Moses, there is going to be a temple built for Almighty God in the body of Christ in the last days, the Bible says that the farmer is going to be greater than the, the latter is going to be greater than the farmer. Now listen to the apostle Peter. To whom coming as living stones? This is First Peter two four four and five. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed by men. Jesus is the cornerstone, but chosen by God and precious. Ye also as living stones are being built into a spiritual house. When the whole body functions the way it's supposed to be, it builds a, a spiritual house. Not a physical one that's going to be built in Jerusalem or Cleveland, Tennessee, or wherever else anybody thinks that, that uh, Jerusalem has been moved to. <laughs> you know, some Springfield's their Jerusalem, some is Cleveland, Tennessee, some it's another place. The temple is the whole rim that the body of Christ functioning together so that Jesus can come and inhabit. But he didn't, he doesn't sit to stop there. As we all do what we're supposed to do, and we're living stones, unhewn stones, we got to quit the denominational cookie cutter. You see, you're, there, there's something within you that's the stone. Everything sin has put on you is not stone. It's miry clay, okay? And some people will look, you know, it's like here with these stones. If I had huge big hunks of mortar down here, you would not think that the mortar was part of the stone. But what the devil has convinced us is he tries to get us to define ourselves by the junk he has piled on us to hide who we really are in Christ. So the whole concept of no matter what it is that I'm made this way, whether it's your attitude, your sexuality, whatever the case may be, he wants you to define yourself based upon the junk he has piled on you, but the gospel washes all that off, and when that's all off, you have a living stone, and there's a perfect place for you that will only fit when the junk is washed off. You turn from a stone of death 
to a living stone that has purpose in the kingdom that will outlast your life on earth. Oh, I'm getting happy now, okay? But he doesn't stop there. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. A holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. What we're going to get into our next session is what happened there on the day of Pentecost. The greatest definition of it is not speaking in tongues. It's not the birth of the church. It's the birth of the kingdom priesthood. This is something I have never heard anybody else teach. And I think it's part of the missing piece of the puzzle for us to find out who we're supposed to be in the body and how to function in it. And I'm excited about it, but I had to build this, this foundation because the priesthood, you have to move in the inherent, the inherent power of your new nature. I don't care if you're drafting sound systems for churches. There can be an anointing in it that when you pray over it and you get done with it, it sounds better than if anybody else would have done it. Or if you're a locksmith, you get into places nobody else can get into, and when you secure it, nobody else can get into it, because that's the way it's supposed to work. Each one of us, there's an anointing for mothers to disciple their children. There's a lot the Word of God says about the, the Torah of the mother. And then as the kids get around 13, then it's the Torah of the Father. There's an anointing for that. There's an anointing for business. And it's all building the kingdom and being a testimony in the earth. There's, a, there's an anointing for leadership, even in government. While we have those saying that Christians should not be allowed in politics, which is actually a violation of the Constitution, because there's a line in one of the amendments that say that there can be no religious rule, either for or against. It's your ability to lead and understand the Constitution. We need, how many know we need Christians in politics? We need Christians in business. We need, we need Christian doctors that can sit there and medicine says there's no hope and he goes to praying and God gives him a supernatural answer and saves somebody's life. That's the kingdom in operation and it's just as important, if not more important, than the preacher preaching in the pulpit. And it's an active part of the priesthood. Now I will say this, any time that you're doing things as part of your kingdom priesthood, which is all your life, and you do something in excellence that shows forth the power of God because you figured out things nobody could figure out. You could do it better than anybody else. That is a sweet-smelling sacrifice to the Lord. And it's how the temple is supposed to function. Well, Father, we thank you today for the word. Father, I ask that it will not return to you void, but Father, we stand on Isaiah that says that your word will accomplish whereunto you have sent it. Father, open our eyes, change our paradigms. Father, expand our understanding of the kingdom so that our faith can reach out and begin accessing it for the sake of your great name in the earth, Jesus. And we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.